Hello everyone, welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on FDA's current thinking on compliance for phase one, investigational drug and biologic products. My name is Liz, I'm going to be your host today. On behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to thank you for all for being part of this event. Today's webinar will be presented by Thomas E. Colonna. Thomas E. Colonna earned a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Cyprus in Philadelphia, a PhD in Molecular Biology from the John Hopkins University, and a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. In addition, Dr. Colonna holds academic appointments at John Hopkins University and the University of Cyprus in Philadelphia. He provides consulting services in the scientific and regulatory aspects of a wide range of medical devices and biologics with particular expertise in the areas of in vitro diagnostics, medical device software, and bio biotechnology-based products. He consults clients range from Fortune 500 companies to small startup companies located throughout the U.S., as well as Canada, India, and Russia. Widely published in numerous fields, he brings a unique multidisciplinary approach to problem solving. We are honored to have Thomas E. Colonna with us to present the webinar today. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to inform you that the program is outlined for 60 minutes duration. Firstly, Thomas will explain to you the areas that will be covered and then he will share with you his presentation. We would also like to inform you that all the participants once per the teleconference have been placed on mute and will remain so until the Q&A begins towards the end of the webinar. We also request all of you to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. Ten minutes of the time will be allotted for the Q&A, during which your questions will be answered. If for any reason you get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we are all ready to start, I request Thomas to take it from here. Thomas? Okay, thank you all for coming. I will um, try to get a little bit more than 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers. So let's begin with a little bit of a historical overview of FDA's thinking regarding compliance for phase one investigational drug and biologic products. Drugs and biologics, including investigational new drugs, are required to be manufactured in accordance with current good manufacturing practices. Um, there's 21 CFR 210 and 211 cover current good manufacturing practices for finished pharmaceuticals. This uh, goes back to 1978. There's also the Q7A GMP compliance for active pharmaceutical ingredients adopted by FDA in September of 2001. Going as far back as the preamble for the 1978 rule, there's a quote in there, a response to comment number 49, that the commissioner finds that as stated in 21 CFR 211.1, these CGMP regulations apply to the preparation of any drug product for administration to humans or animals, including those still in investigational stages. There are a few FDA guidance documents that directly address issues related to CGMPs for investigational products. There's the FDA guideline on the preparation of investigational new drug products, human and animal, from 1991. There's um, the aforementioned section 19 of the Q7A GMP guidance for active pharmaceutical ingredients from September of 2001. And there's the guidance for industry CGMP for phase one investigational drugs from July 2008. So the Federal Regis Register notice back in 2008, which announced the, the guidance, uh, amended 21 CFR part 210 to add paragraph C an investigational drug for use in a phase one study as described in paragraph 312.21a of this chapter is subject to the statutory requirements set forth in 21 USC 351a to b. The production of such drug is exempt from compliance with the regulations in part 21 of this chapter. 
the exemption does not apply to an investigational drug for use in a phase one study once the investigational drug has been made available for use by or for the sponsor in a phase two or phase three study or the drug has been lawfully marketed. So there's kind of a two-tier approach and a, an exemption um, for the first time through a phase one. But if a product has already gone through and it's being um, manufactured for a clinical trial for a second intended use, then that exemption would not apply. In the Federal Register Notice, the FDA distinguished between statutory CGMPs and regulatory CGMPs. Statutory CGMPs set forth in USC Title 21 stated a drug shall be deemed to be adulterated if it is a drug and the method used in or the facilities or controls used for its manufacture, processing, packaging, or uh, holding do not conform to or are not operated or administered in conformity with the current good manufacturing practice to assure that such drug meets the requirements of this chapter as to safely, as to safety and has the identity and strength and meets the quality and purity characteristics which it purports or is represented to possess. That's from the statute. Regulatory CGMPs are what's specified in 21 CFR Code of Federal Regulations, parts 210 and 211. So you have the statutes and you have the code. The legal difference is that the statutes are set forth by Congress and signed into law. The regulations are created through the public rulemaking process by the agency, by FDA, and they're codified in the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, so um, statutory are mandated by Congress. Um, they're part of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The FDA is charged with the responsibility to interpret and enforce the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Through public rulemaking, they fill in, fill in the blanks, fill in the details, so to speak, that the statutes don't explicitly cover, the statutory language doesn't specifically cover. And 21 CFR Parts 210 and 211 are FDA's interpretation of what the term means with respect to drugs. Um, FDA has decided that Parts 210 and 211 do not apply to drugs used for Phase 1 investigational studies. The FDA uh, provided FDA follows the proper administrative process and has authority to make that determination. First attempt through the direct rule failed because of significant adverse comments. Subsequently, standard notice and comment rulemaking approach was taken. So, FDA is amending the scope of the section of drug CGMP regulations in Part 210 to make clear that production of investigational drugs for use in Phase 1 clinical trials conducted under an IND does not need to comply with the regulations in Part 211. Therefore, this final rule exempts the pr production of Phase 1 investigational drugs from complying with the regulatory requirements set forth in 21, part, 21 CFR Parts 210 and 211. This is nearly a verbatim um, restatement of the direct final rule published by FDA in 2006. So FDA's rationale is the approach described in the guidance reflects the fact that some manufacturing controls and the extent of manufacturing controls needed to achieve the appropriate uh, product quality differ not only between the investigational and commercial manufacturer, but also among the various phases of clinical trials. To assist the 
drug development process by streamlining streamlining the application of CGMP that is more appropriate to the manufacture of the earliest stage investigational drug products that is intended for phase one clinical trials. Okay, so the guidance document from 2008 applies to investigational recombinant and non-recombinant therapeutic products, vaccine, gene therapy, um, allergenic, plasma-derived, and somatic cellular therapy products, as well as in vivo diagnostics. It does not apply to human cell or tissue products regulated solely under Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act blood and blood components, products regulated as medical devices, and already approved products and or products in phase two, three used in other phase one studies. Now for compliance, you still need um, well-defined written procedures. It has to be written down. Procedures have to be written down, standard operating procedures, and your your data. I mean, it doesn't have to be physically written down. Obviously, there's electronic records, and electronic documentation, but there needs to be um, records. Adequately controlled equipment and manufacturing environment, which includes comprehensive and systematic evaluation of manufacturing setting to identify potential hazards to the quality of the drug, appropriate actions prior to and during manufacturing to eliminate or mitigate potential hazards, accurate and consistent recording of data with manufacturing and testing, technologies to facilitate CGMP conformance and streamline product development. These would include upstream, downstream, disposable equipment and process aids, Prepackaged materials and sterilized containers, closed process equipment, contract or shared manufacturing and test testing facilities. There's specific manufacturing controls, trained and experienced personnel. That's a big one. Um, during inspections, they, um, the inspectors can go around asking employees about what it is that they do. And if it appears that they're not trained and experienced, that often gets cited. Um, there has to be a formal quality control function, adequate work areas and equipment. This is an area where it gets a little gray. Um, you know, what constitutes adequate isn't always consistent from one GMP inspector to another. Uh, component control and traceability. Written manufacturing and process control procedures, which would include manufacturing records, record of changes in procedures and processes. Uh, record of microbiological controls, laboratory controls, packaging, labeling, and distribution controls, record keeping. Written quality control plan for review and release of components, review and approval of production procedures, testing procedures, and acceptance criteria, release or reject for each batch upon cumulative review, investigate errors, and initiate corrective actions. Responsibilities are performed independently from production. Appropriately trained individuals sufficient to perform QC function. So you need special people that are trained in QC and that um, are independent from production. This can be a challenge in a startup where you have just a few people 
and they are wearing many hats. What you can do is you can outsource and have a consulting firm um, to handle some of these QC responsibilities if there aren't enough folks to have production people and then QC people that aren't also production people. Facilities um, need to be adequate and appropriate. HVAC, light, water, plumbing, space, general infrastructure. Adequate air handling to prevent contamination and cross-contamination. Water of appropriate source and quality. Adequate work areas for intended tasks. Procedural controls to avoid contamination and mix-ups. And we'll get a little bit more into some of these areas um, that are particularly a challenge when you have R&D going on along with production in the same space, same facility, if you will. Equipment needs to be appropriate for intended function. It needs to be properly maintained, calibrated, clean, sanitized, following written procedures and appropriate intervals. Conducted with material that will not contaminate or be reactive, additive, or absorptive with the product. Identified and documented in production records. Components, you need written procedures describing handling and control of components. Establish specified attributes and acceptance criteria. Review of documentation to ensure conformance. Testing when documentation is incomplete. Record relevant information, have traceability. For production and documentation, production follows written procedures. FDA's mantra is always, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. So you, know, you need to record, record, record. Records of manufacturing and testing data, components, equipment, and procedures used. Records of changes in procedures and processes. Records of microbiological control of sterile process drugs. Laboratory production tests, specified quality attributes monitored, appropriate acceptance criteria applied, known safety related and other tests as appropriate. Must have scientifically sound analytical procedures, specificity, sensitivity, accuracy. Tests conducted using written procedures under controlled conditions. Periodic calibration and maintenance of laboratory equipment. Consider system suitability. Retain representative sample for additional release testing. And initiate stability study to support use in clinical trials. Container closure and labeling. Packaging to protect products from contamination and damage during handling, including shipment and storage and control labeling to prevent mix-ups. That's always a big one. Usually it's not that the product is mislabeled, it's often the dosage is mislabeled. So that can be a big deal. Um, distribution describes the transport of the IND product from the point of production to the patient or subject for consumption. Records should allow for traceability. Retain records related to quality and production process. Retention of records required by IND Part 32, which is also 21 CFR 312.57. Two years after approval of the marketing application, Two years after shipment and delivery of the investigational drug, if discontinued and FDA notified. So, in other words, if you didn't get approval and you've aborted your um, attempt at approval, 
and for two years after shipment and delivery. Special manufacturing considerations, multi-product facilities, big issues there are cross-contamination and dedicated equipment, biological and biotechno biotechnological products, Big issues there, process consistency, retain samples, assurance that safety-related functions are effective. Sterile aseptically processed products. Some issues there, manual filling of small batches, time-sensitive or liable products. And then there's personalized medicine, which typically has very small batch sizes and is often autologous. So the multi-product, generally only one product manufactured in an area room at a time. Same area room may be used for multiple purposes if appropriate design and procedural controls allow for orderly handling of materials and equipment to prevent contamination, cross-contamination, and mix-ups. So you need to have tight procedures in place to prevent contamination, cross-contamination, and mix-ups. If you're going to have multiple products, um, or multiple products made in the same room, or the same room is going to be used for multiple purposes, meaning it could be used for R&D and then for production for small scale for phase one. You need to have effective cleaning and changeover procedures. You know, when, when are you doing R&D and when are you doing production? Consider unknowns. Don't place existing system processes and facilities at risk. So for biological and biotechnological products, appropriate equipment qualification and controls and production needed to assure safety related function. For example, viral clearance, viral toxin and activation, pasteurization will perform as intended. Difficulty distinguishing changes in quality attributes or predicting impact of observed changes on safety. Consistency among batches if not possible to comply with CGMPs, then include rationale for approaches followed in records for investigational products. And include your reason. So document what you did, why you did it. Sterile aseptic processing, remember for phase one, Investigational Products, Safety and Rights of Subject, 21 CFR 312.22a. Take special precautions of appropriate training. Aseptic manipulation conducted under appropriate conditions. For example, Class 100 conditions, the laminar flow load. Document and follow all procedures intended to maintain the sterility of the component in process materials active pharmaceutical ingredient, and final product. For personalized medicine, studies are often performed in a small-scale lab or research lab. When in the same area, study and research lab are used for special considerations, orderly handling of materials and equipment, avoid contamination of equipment and product, prevent mix-ups equipment used for a single purpose at any given time. So if you're using a piece of equipment for research use, and you can also use it for production, you can't use it for research use and production use concurrently. You need to dedicate it that now is research time and you don't use it for production, or now is production time and you only use it for production and you don't use it for research at that time. FDA is facing challenges to accommodate major changes in new drugs. 
more pharmacological specificity, fewer side effects. Directed towards niche applications, which the downside will be, at least monetarily for the industry, uh, fewer blockbuster products. Intended for specific genotypes, so personalized drugs. Resolve conflicting pressures on drug approval, a cost of, of reduce the cost of drug development. Make new drugs available as quickly as possible. And dealing with, you know, the unenviable zero tolerance for risk. Improve safety of drugs on the market, improve the product review process, strengthen post-marketing surveillance, avoid real or perceived conflicts of interest. Mainly that circulates around the perception by some that um, user fees somehow influence decisions at the agency. Benefits for FDA and industry, you can have smaller, less costly facilities. Disposable and premixed solutions are sanctioned. All levels of manufacturing infrastructure can be reduced. Time cost of manufacturing phase one product reduced. More products can enter phase one. Provides clarity of FDA's expectations for phase one. So 21 CFR Part 211 is not being enforced to the letter on Phase 1 manufacturing. A little side note, um, Phase 1 manufacturing sites are virtually never inspected, They're rarely inspected. Um, FDA only has so many inspectors and there's an awful lot of facilities out there to inspect. So um, phase one site often isn't um, high on the priority list, and even if it was on the priority list, by the time they work it into the schedule, often phase one is done, and so there's nothing to inspect. Um, the guidance better defines CMC requirements for phase one INDs addresses needs to source product for physician IND, allows FDA to focus on later stages of drug development, and serves public interest. All right, so got lots of time for questions. Thank you very much, Tom. That was a wonderful presentation. And I would also like to thank all the participants to cooperate with us. Uh, to Anise, as Tom said, that this is the time for question and answer. So if you have any question for Tom, I request you all to click on the raise hand option, which is a palm-like icon at the bottom of your participant panel, so that I can unmute you and you can ask your question to Tom verbally. Or else you can also post your question in our Q&A panel, or else you can send your question to me via our chat panel. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for Tom, you can go ahead, please. Meanwhile, I sincerely request you to share your feedback in the polling panel, which will appear on your screen right now. This feedback form has just eight questions, and they are multiple choice in nature and you can answer the answer this feedback even after the Q&A is over. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any question for Tom, you can go ahead, please. Dear Denise, uh, today's uh, session which you have attended is also available with us in recorded format. So if you think any of your colleagues or friends might get benefits from this webinar, you can always visit our website and purchase them. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, 
you can go ahead, please. Leave in case you come across with any question, and then after the session is over, you can always send your question to me, uh, which I will further pass on to Tom. Um, Tom, I'm not seeing any question coming up from our attendees. So before we end the session, would you like to say any parting words to all of us, please? Sure. Um, phase one is is always a challenge because you're still still kind of doing research in a way. Um, you know, you're still um, zeroing in on your dosage. You're still detecting adverse effects, adverse events. Um, the manufacturer is, is a challenge, particularly um, with a lot of the, the biotechnology derived products because of scale up issues, you know, the manufacturing process is roughly the same, but scaling up from the small scale batches to the large you know, commercial industrial scale batches, uh, there are certain challenges with with the scale up process, particularly with biotechnology, um, it's um, it's it's a difficult challenge that FDA is trying to to balance. They're always balancing risk versus reward, and uh, they understand that there's inherent risk in any biomedical product. But meanwhile, they're trying to um, you know minimize that risk, but they also understand in some cases um, the potential reward requires that a, a certain risk threshold be accepted. This is not often easy to translate or communicate to a lay public that often demands zero risk. So it's um, it's a challenge in trying to streamline the process. The um, fail quicker mantra, you know, if you're not going to uh, to make it to market, better in the IND in phase one than in phase three after you invested considerably more resources. So FDA is um, cognizant of that and um, is trying to accommodate some of that to try to reduce overall cost, but they also have their own public health mission to um, uphold. All right. Well, if there's no other um, no questions. We can um, call it call it the end of a webinar. Uh, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom, uh, there you have concluded the session, but one of our attendees has a question for you. So can, you, uh, can I just unmute the, the attendee? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. You have a question. Thank you, Tom. Had, uh, can you just go ahead with your question, please? Hi. Um, I would like to know, we are just in the process of um, developing a product uh, which is not biologics but uh, a nanomedicine and we do have, we think we do have this scale up procedure. Um, at this point, is it, uh, and this is a parenteral product, IV, at this point we do have two options. We may have our own GMP lab facility to build within the university facility or to outsource for the uh, phase one clinical uh, studies. Uh, which one would you recommend to us? Which route? Just outsourcing or um, is it feasible to build our own GMP facility for this product? 
well, yeah, you, you need to see what assets you currently have and what resources you currently have to try to figure out what what gaps you have in terms of building your own versus outsourcing. Usually, if it's a small startup that um, doesn't have a lot of, of internal resources and particular personnel and so forth, they kind of really don't have a choice. They have to outsource. But if, but if you have a choice, you know, if you have uh, the resources in-house, you need to really sit down and, and think about it and, and try to figure out which which makes economic sense and um, also really look hard at the feasibility of doing it in-house. What type of personnel we should specifically need to build it ourselves? Well, if you have, you have people with um, you know, regulatory training in-house, are, are you comfortable with your in-house regulatory folks, people that are well-versed in writing quality plans, documentation, procedures? I see. Okay. Yeah, the people who are going to work in that lab. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's 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 one of the reasons why we have a big uh, contract research organization, you know, industry out there, is right. it's it's easier to just pay the money and punt, and and they already have all sorts of of, of record keeping processes. They have equipment. Um, they've got the infrastructure. They've got the training. They got procedures, it's, it's it's very challenging at the beginning to develop all these standard operating procedures, all these documents you're going to need, all these procedures, all the, the record keeping, setting up all those, those files can be quite daunting and take a bunch of resources. If So it's very tempting to just punt it out to somebody, well, they've already got all that infrastructure. It's very easy for them to do massage their templates, fill in the blanks, and they're off and running, as opposed to us starting with a blank sheet. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have any questions, I uh, just uh, wait for last 20 seconds, Tom. If we have any questions, we'll go ahead or uh, we will conclude the session. Tom, uh, we don't have any uh, more questions, uh, so I'll just go ahead and end this uh, uh, webinar, ladies and gentlemen. We are grateful to all of you for taking part in this webinar, and if you would like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email to webinars at, train, uh, at globalcompliancepanel.com. And uh, we also welcome your suggestions and feedback or ideas on how we can improve our webinars. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon. On behalf of our presenter, Tom Colonna, and the entire Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to say thank you. Uh, for participating in this webinar, and I wish you a pleasant day ahead. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Liz. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Okay. You too.